this podcast, we'll take you on a journey where you will discover that at the junction of tech and copyright, while we are living in a digital age with unlimited potential, many walls have come up, making it more difficult for users and creators to access, share, and reuse what is available online and offline. This journey will take many stops. We're interviewing a variety of people, ranging from internet entrepreneurs to librarians and publishing professionals, from digital rights activists to sci-fi writers, and we ask them how copyright and tech affect their daily lives. In this episode, our guest is Catherine Steeler. Catherine Steeler, OBE, she has been an international champion for openness as a legislator and practitioner for over 20 years. Uh, she was a member of European Parliament for Scotland, representing the Labour Party. And at the European Parliament, she, be she became one of Scotland's longest serving and most respected legislators. In August 2022, uh, 2020, sorry, Catherine was appointed Chief Executive Officer of Creative Commons, a nonprofit organization that helps overcome legal obstacles to advance better sharing of knowledge and creativity to address the world's pressing challenges. Hi, Catherine. Welcome to World Culture. Thank you, Gwen. Great to be here. Um, so uh, your current and previous roles, first as a member of the European Parliament, then at Open Knowledge and now at Creative Commons, have been characterized by a common threat, namely striving um, for a global push towards yeah. openness and open knowledge. Could you tell us why this mission is so crucial, especially in this day and age, and what hurdles you faced in pushing this agenda forward? Well, thanks, Gwen, and thanks for inviting me on to your podcast. It's great to, great to be here. Um, I think that, uh, you know, my background, having been brought up in Scotland and in a, in a family of teachers um, with a grandmother that had to leave school early because uh, her father had died and they had to work and education. She didn't have a high school education. She had to go and work to uh, support her family. And so my grandmother and her sister instilled in me the importance of education and sport, the importance of libraries, the importance of reading there were some of the, you know, my, my gran and my aunt are now uh, passed away, but they were some of the most well-read people I've ever met. And their love for literature, their love for access to information, to knowledge, I think had a lasting impact on me. And as I say, my parents were uh, teachers. My dad was a, a geography teacher. He's actually my geography teacher. And uh, and my, uh, my mum was a primary teacher. And so, again, the importance that education is 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 critical to not only um you uh, being able to fill your potential but also for your comp contribution to society your contribution to helping other people and so um you know maybe i never planned to be a politician that was not something i thought about at school it was certainly not something when i started at university that was my you know burning passion but when i went to the uh, University of St Andrews, which um, really changed my life in terms of um, my political activity, becoming president of the Students Association, and then very recently I was the rector of the university, and uh, most recently the chair of the governing body. Um, going to a university where you were exposed to different thoughts and 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 different people, and 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 that kind of thinking, and then leading to where I ended up in in, in at the age of twenty five, I was the youngest elected. A representative at that moment for the United Kingdom to enter the European Parliament in 1999, which, you know, looking back on it, feels such a time of hope. It feels such a different, a different world, really, that we're in today. And um, and to have had a career for 20 years, at, from the age of 25 to to when I left, when I was what, 45, 46. Um, you know, really, you know, you saw so many changes. You saw the enlargement of the EU. You saw uh, the euro. <laughs> uh, and very sadly, I witnessed my own country leaving the European Union, uh, something which to this day I think is a real tragedy for the United Kingdom and, uh, and is something that will be felt for generations to come. But on openness particularly, I started to get involved in a campaign to do with ebook access around about 2011. And it was came about because um, I realised in Scotland that, you know, ebooks were start, you know, libraries were starting to to lend ebooks, but but some libraries were able to do it really effectively and others were not. And you're kind of like, well, what's going on? And it turned out of all the local authorities in Scotland, the one local authority that was just excelling at this 
was a local authority called Weston Bartonshire. Now, it'll come as no surprise to you that the person that was running the kind of ebook access campaign as the kind of key librarian had come from a computer science background and saw the importance of this. I'd got Weston Bartonshire um, involved, and Weston Bartonshire was one of the poorest local authorities. And you're kind of like, how is Weston Bartonshire doing this? And why can they? Um, why can't this not be replicated across all local authorities? So I started, interestingly, an open knowledge campaign um, to kind of promote the ebook access in public libraries. Um, and 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 part of that was also to do with my involvement in thinking around. Um, uh, rights for visually uh, impaired and blind uh, blind people um, because uh, we saw that, you know, there was a book famine and I got quite involved in that. Um, I'd previously been involved in getting real and pharmaceutical packaging. And so it was really, you know, I, I got a piece of, I, I put an amendment down, a piece of legislation, which for the first time across the whole of the European Union meant that, that Braille had to be on a pharmaceutical package. So my involvement in terms of uh, of, 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 of rights for um, uh, for for blind and and, and 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 people who are visually impaired um, ended up kind of becoming something else, and then you saw the right, you know, the Marrakesh Treaty, and you saw what was happening with the book famine, and you saw um, the importance of access to knowledge and rights for, for for individuals, and and you could see how you could have an impact at the European level to make sure that the people that you were representing could have access and 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 that was important to me as well. So my my open knowledge campaign then in 2014 I became the rapporteur for the internal market committee on the copyright um well it wasn't the copyright proposal came out a couple of years after 2014 but we were starting to think about copyright. So getting more and more involved with that coming from a background of importance of libraries education I became involved and and founded the kind of library or the library or party group in the European Parliament because we felt the libraries just didn't have a voice and really civil society more generally when you're looking at the scale of what we experienced within the debate of copyright when I was a Euro when I was in the European Parliament was just extraordinary um the fact that you on one side had this dominance of right holders and the other side you had you know civil society trying to to, to, to have a different viewpoint, but equally kind of to be heard in a space which was quite challenging. Um, and so, you know, fast forward to 2019, uh, where I left the European Parliament, went to work for the Open Knowledge Foundation, and then found myself in 2020, August 2020, having the privilege and honour of running what I see as a uh, is an incredible organisation which is celebrating 20 years as Creative Commons and, and what it's done to to really transform how we see copyright and how we do copyright from an all rights reserved copyright to a some rights reserved copyright. And, and that is so, you know, just the, the change that that has made in terms of doing things differently. I don't think perhaps we just realise how much that was needed and how much we have managed to open up content you know, and, and and be able to change globally how how we've been doing things. Um, so it's it's a real privilege to run an organisation with such a vision about opening knowledge and, and culture for everyone everywhere and making sure that accessibility is is really, you know, key to being able to share and impart knowledge. Okay, we, we'll talk more about Creative Commons in a, in a bit, but just before we get to that, I, I just wanted to, because you mentioned the Copyright Directive, oh, yes. you, were, you were an EP <laughs> at the time. Um, well, you, you won't be surprised that this is a, a popular topic in this, uh, yeah. this uh, podcast yes. series. Quite a lot of our guests have very strong opinions on it. Um, like, for example, uh, Catherine Mayer, who's uh, the former Wikimedia CEO, she, she uh, did not see it as a win. Um, and she considered that it failed to focus on creators and, and that really nothing to advance the idea of free culture. Like from a, from a real insider perspective, could you just take us uh, through how the directive got shaped and why it turn, turned out this way? And um, do you agree that there could have been, there was more into it or do you think this was like, are, are you satisfied with how this turned out? I, I don't think anybody is satisfied how, how the copyright um <laughs> and it turned out in in the end, and now how we're seeing its effects and how it's being interpreted and 
and we'll hear from the court, I think, on the 20th, the 26th of April, we'll hear the judgment. But um, just, I mean, if I can give some of my own personal reflections, I can't speak for, for Catherine, uh, but, but it, what I think is, is, is interesting is that, um, you know, I've, I've worked on a number of dossiers in the European Parliament over my 20-year tenure as a member of the European Parliament. Um, and one of my first early experiences was working against the tobacco industry um, and uh, and fighting that industry to be able to get um, graphic pictures and cigarette packets. And anyway, we got that through. Um, and so that lobby was ferocious. Thinking about 2014 and when I left in 2019 and looking at the kind of lobbying that was going on um, not giving civil society perspective, but from purely rights holders. Um, and they're, you know, they've got the right to lobby, you know. Um, but I have never seen anything quite like this. And either you were with them or you were the complete enemy. There was just no in-between. And we all know that it's the in-between where you can make a difference and where it is really important. And so for those of us that wanted to see a progressive copyright, which I would say is I'm one of those people, I wouldn't be running Creative Commons today if I wasn't. Um, you know, we were, we were outnumbered. But one reflection I want to make to the community that we're talking to today is that, you know, we can't just say that, you know, the, 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 our opposition was ferocious and it's because of that that this... We also have to look at ourselves and think a little bit about how we can work more closely together as an open movement, having common goals that we all agree upon when we are facing such a ferocious lobby of the other side of the argument. And thinking now, um, I think that cooperation from those of us who are open advocates, those of us who believe in this world, believe that the, the public domain is truly the public domain and should be shared and, and enabled and accessible, um, that I do think that we need to work harder together. And I do think that we need to be able to have more common approaches when we're addressing policymakers. Because we can talk to ourselves and be very comfortable with that. But actually, if we are going to really radically reform copyright rules and policies, we have to work much more collectively together to have our voice heard. And it's, it's something which, um, having been on the other side and now on the side of um, you know, running an organisation with limited resources and trying to work with others who also have limited resources, how can we do that better? And how can we collectively work more closely together to be effective? Because over the past 20 years, I mean, Creative Commons was created to address a failed copyright system. And we thought in the past, you know, we thought that the copyright reform would come. Well, it didn't come. And what we see time and time again is copyright um, becoming more regressive. I mean, you just see this with the, what is it, the, 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 the New Zealand, or is it, was it the Australian-UK trade agreement, you know, or I think it was in New Zealand, 20 years more, you know, kind of for, where did that 20 years come from? Why are we adding more restriction rather than creating more freedom? And we saw with Canada, was it this, we're getting the end of last week, wasn't it? Again, more restriction on, how are we not being able to to talk about those issues in a way which we can be effective in ensuring that that the public domain is um, is protected, enhanced, supported, promoted. Um, so there's something I'm I, oh, I'm I'm just trying to to think how can we be more effective together, and I think that's something that's our challenge. I mean, we can talk about the opposition and they're, you know, they're very effective at working together and being able to have common lines and, and being able to, 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 to lobby very effectively. And we need to be able to do some of that in order that our voice is heard. Because if we are not there at the table and our voice is not heard, and if we're not including policymakers in some of that debate, how are we ever going to influence the people who are actually making the law, which then will become what we will have to, to, to live with? So um, I do have some reflections, still grappling, um, 
still kind of looking at what we created in terms of the EU copy and think of what a missed opportunity that was, but also thinking about how quickly things change. I mean, when we were talking about text and data mining, we didn't really talk about artificial intelligence in the way today you would be much more talking about in, a, in that kind of debate and context. And, and how do you future-proof? How do we make sure that the legislation um, is fit for purpose um, is a challenge, but we need to engage with policy makers in order to influence. And I think we've got still a big job of work to do as an open movement to, to convince and influence. So, yeah, so, so, so uh, Creative Commons says they're celebrating your 20th birthday yeah. um, last year, was it, right? So <laughs> congratulate, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, you've, you've, um, You've talked about Creative Commons like as a movement or a stakeholder organization, sure. or however, how, however you want to want to frame it. But um, what, what I was wondering, like, what role do you see for the Creative Commons licenses yeah, yeah, yeah. themselves in the years to come? Because you've already mentioned like like uh, things are going so fast. And just this morning, I was reading this yeah. article by by your council about uh, the use of Creative Commons images for uh, training AI yeah, yeah, systems. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a bit more your vision on 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 what role these licenses will play? Uh, in the next years? Well, one reflection, Gwen, is that the licenses have become even more important than less important. And I say this for a couple of reasons. One is what we talked about before, that you know we've, we've got copyright laws across our world not enhancing you know, the comments, but actually going backward rather than forward, which makes the licenses even more important because our copyright rules are not are not coming up to speed in the way that we need them to or how we envisaged copyright reform happening and so so that that's that's one reflection i mean this this the second reflection is that licenses will stop i mean kind of understanding what a license does and how it applies and and we're very acutely aware of how um how people apply our licenses and how we can make that even more um, user friendly and how we can, you know, we've had different versions over the years of the licenses to address the, the, our learning as well from, from how we can improve things. And, and so um, our latest, the, the 4.0, you know, um, version of our licenses has, 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 has certainly improved what we, we started. But one thing I keep coming back to is that you know Creative Commons was created 20, 21 years ago. It's the licenses this year celebrate 20 years. So the licenses came a year after. And it was to address a problem really of American copyright failing. Um, and, and, and what is extraordinary was that in creating something that was to address an American problem, we created this global energy, interest, community, which we still have today because it wasn't just an American problem that was being addressed, really. It was a global problem of failed sharing and how we could share legally in a better way to allow people to be able to share in ways that they wanted to, from as restrictive a way to as all-encompassing a way as being as open as possible. Um, and that was so enlightened um, 20 years ago and yet it's still it's important if you look at kind of research today and how you know the open access movement which back in 20 years ago what, what is was not the same as it is today and we see how research is so important in terms of being able to share information globally that the licenses then enable that sharing to solve some of our most pressing problems and and that is is extraordinary that power that tool that we have. Boss, as you know, Gwen, our our tool is completely free, and and yet the licenses and that important piece of infrastructure. You know, some, I think it was Pam Samuelson talked about Creative Commons as being you know a, a public interest technology, and 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 it so is because it's enabling so much, and yet you know the licenses need continual investment. And you need to keep making sure that um, that those licenses are invested in and the infrastructure is invested in. And that is a challenge that, that as a global not-for-profit, you know, you're 
continually challenge that funders don't want to fund open infrastructure, uh, yet it's so pivotal to so much to enable the, the sharing of knowledge and culture across our world. Um, so, you know, we, we, we stand um, today reflecting on that 20 years anniversary last year of, of the organisation and this year of the licences themselves. And, and I think that um, the fact that they are so critical to so much uh, is, is a testament to the vision 20 years ago, but it's also a testament to how we need to support uh, a, a thriving commons and our licenses still, because they've become a global standard, uh, have have enabled and are still enabling today to be make that happen. Um, so the, the weight of responsibility, Gwen, on, on, on Creative Commons shoulders to ensure that our licenses, um, and you mentioned the question that, you know, that, 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 that uh, about the training aspect and they're very, you know, 20, 20 years ago, that was not something, now it's something that we, you know, we, 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 we are looking at thinking about being thoughtful about and about how we can do things better. Um, you know, clearly uh, how those, how, you know, how our licenses are applied is something which, um, which we are, thoughtful about and and continue to be and and that responsibility that we have is 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 so important um mm -hmm. so you've already you've you've mentioned um that you know you're worried about this increase in copyright uh, yeah. duration like being included in trade agreements um to put it very generalistically um are there any like other legislative 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 developments around the world uh, because you have that global perspective of course um yeah. that, that worry you and and that could hinder the future the further uptake of creative commons licenses i think that um as i said before the fact that copyright is not reforming in the same way and you mentioned that at the beginning that we are seeing still you know that copyright reform seems to be going backward and forward have implications for 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 years and for generations to come. Um, I think that the question around artificial intelligence is an interesting one, and I think that the the work that's happening at the European level just now, um, the 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 road the you know the roadmap draft that the AI has enormous technological potential, but but also you know, has real challenges is something where um, we've started to think a little bit about, about how we can be more influencing. And we saw that the special committee is now concluded in the EU on artificial intelligence. And and I think that the, the part that I think we are quite interested in is how can we ensure that this innovation also has that human aspect to it as well. And so there's something there where that intersection about where our licenses play, but the kind of human responsibility too. We also, if you look at what's happening in, in the US with the Supreme Court, um, the fair use case on Andy Warhol's Prince artwork, that has you know a huge um, implication in terms of what that, um, what, what could come out of that in terms of fair use. And so, this is something I think that that we should be paying attention to, and uh, and I think that um, that that it, it, particularly for 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 access in, in museums um, who may be displaying this work and who may find that the ruling could go against. So there's something about public access to 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 works which is in in a physical sense, not a virtual sense, that is it that that, that has implications with that. And then I think um, you know we're keeping a close look at what's happening with um, data rules in the EU because of the global implication that that could have um, across the world in terms of rules and rule setting. But at the moment, what is very and you'll see this going where you are in Gain is that I mean that maybe I don't know you know before the war in Ukraine happened, we were thinking about. The data act. We're thinking more about some of the digital things. I think now, um, certainly at an EU level, that um, the focus is 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 very much on what's happening with EU defence policy, what's happening about energy security, and so I think some of the issues which matter to us, 
are 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 going to be again more challenging to be heard because of the political context that we're existing in. Um, and you know we're, we're all horrified with what's happening in Ukraine, and it's just you know as a reminder of why why the EU exists <laughs> and, and why peace is so important. But um, I think that uh, the implications of the war in Ukraine, both in the EU and the world, is is something that we it will be emerging, uh, and and we are going to have to live with and work with uh, in in years and years to come. Yeah, definitely going to it's definitely going to be a challenge. Um, just like international politics, I would like to step away for a moment from the strictly copyright business. But, uh, <laughs> I would like to. I, <laughs> I know. I would like to hear. <laughs> Sorry. No, I was just going to say, you know, like, um, you know, the, the challenges we have in being heard in 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 more normal times, um, the the challenges we face now to be heard, where some of the debates that are happening. You know, we we can be heard on some things, and for example, the misinformation, disinformation debates, which are certainly being um, uh, more uh, talked about both in the EU and the US, is something where you know our open journalism work that we've just conducted really shows and illustrates the importance of how we can share content to allow to dispel some of the. The, the, the lies that's told. And so I think the, the, the open journalism work that um, Jenin and our team has recently conducted and which we've recently published is, you know, plays to kind of why openness and why bringing something into debate where our relevance is very strongly felt is, is a different way of working, but it's also a way where we can talk about some of the issues of the day and, and and be heard and show what we're doing. I think that's again impactful, illustrate the importance of of, of our work. Yeah, of course. Um, so, what I wanted to ask you about is because I know a lot of creative local creative com. I know from my time at Creative yes. Commons, um, a lot of local teams are working on open business models yeah. and around open innovation. And I was just wondering if you could. Briefly, just for the sake for our listeners to to explain the role Creative Commons can play, uh, and and of course the licensing can play in open business models, and maybe just briefly just explain also what what's the difference between a between a regular business model and an open business model. So I think that from our perspective is that we see the value through openly sharing content works in terms of new knowledge is built. Alone, that knowledge is built on other knowledge and creativity is built on other creativity. And so the importance of that um, and illustrious, sorry, my son's just come in and opened the door there. There you go. It's a, it's a, it's a busy, busy household. But, um, but the, the, the difference that we have is that our tools enable creators to be where they want to be. It's an enabler to, to allow that sharing to create perhaps other works, but also to be able to get your works out in a space and place where you have also power over how that is used and reused in the way that you want it to be. That isn't that that didn't exist really 20 years ago in the way that we've enabled it to exist today. And it's just a, it's an alternative way to do things. And that alternative way of doing things seems to be coming even more important 20 years on than even envisaged at that moment where the organization was created and the license were created a year later. And then, you know, things have developed over that space and time. So I, I always think about it as, as being a way where, you know, our values drive that openness and that sharing because we see that value in why we want the world to to have an improved commons of knowledge, culture, creativity, because that then builds on other things and that creates, you know, and improves and keeps that cycle of, of, of creativity, of thinking, of thoughtfulness, of, of energy, of renewal, of new ideas, and maybe the word innovation, but, but there's something very powerful about that model. And 
I think it, it stems from the values. And if you're value driven in terms of why you want to share your work to, and you could, you know, we, we've always said we, we want artists to be paid. We want creators to have, you know, be, be able to, to, to survive. And, you know, we're, you know, we're not saying everything for, you know, we're, we're saying that this is a way that you can do things that's different, maybe traditional model, but which can actually add such value and empower you in terms of where your creativity and your works will have impact and can lead to other things that maybe you can't even imagine at the moment. Um, so, you know, that's that's maybe, I'm trying to be quite simplistic about it, but, but I do think that's where our, our value-driven approach differs from one that's just very profit-driven approach to how creativity and knowledge can be shared and add value to solve some of our most pressing problems that we're facing as humanity. And, you know, just if you, you look at the moment, what we're trying to do in our new open science programme and trying to open up biodiversity research and, 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 and climate data, because some of that is hidden behind a wall where which can be accessed. And yet that's one of our key pressing problems that we're facing that if we don't address together, and you just saw the, the climate report that came out, what was it, a month, maybe two or three weeks ago, um, but just saying, look, you know, this is this is it. You know, if we do not do something, you know, we will be really affected as humanity. And although we had COP26 in Glasgow back in, in November, that seems like a world ago to where we are in April 2022. Um, and so how do we ensure that that access to that information to be able to solve the world's pressing problem um, can can be um, effectively uh, conducted and 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 I guess solved by that sharing of of information of knowledge to 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 come up with the solutions that we need to be able to tackle the problems that we we all face whether you're in Ghent or I'm here in California now you know wherever you are in this world we see these changes and we know that we need to do something about it and we know that. That, that research that's that's open can help with this, and that's something that Creative Commons is 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 is, is helping with to solve that problem. Um, so, you know, we we continue to to as you know through our open glam work that we are doing, that uh, that Brigitte and Camille and my team are are leading on that that you know we see how opening knowledge in galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. And, and also the preservation of knowledge, something that I, you know, linking to climate change, I hadn't kind of really thought about any in any depth. But, you know, climate change has a huge impact on, on archiving our historical information, which, you know, is, is concerning that we could lose our knowledge because of climate. And making those connections is, is something which um, I'm, I'm always interested in and trying to think about ways that we can make that um, live in different debates and spaces. Who would have thought that glam debate could really have a climate aspect? Well, it can. And there's the interconnections. And there's, again, the sharing of knowledge and culture to be able to solve our pressing problems together. So I think that there's so much value that Creative Commons has because it is a value of, of sharing and, and what we're trying to do in terms of our new strategy, in terms of better sharing, is how can we do that better? What can we do to enable that, 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 that goes from the past 20 years to the next 20 years? And 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 our, our thinking and thoughtfulness around that is, is going to be where we make the change in the next 20 years. Thank you for those insights. I'm going to ask you two questions that I ask every interview. I'm curious about to, to, about oh, to hear your. I'm, I'm a bit worried. Your thoughts. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's. Uh, I mean, I think. I think the first one you also you already addressed uh, partly. I think in the first question. So because this interview it, it appears on a blog. It's called World Culture. Yeah, yeah. And what I want to know from you is, can you recall like that particular moment where you hit that wall and thought like there's something wrong here? Um. Oh, <laughs> well, when you've been on 
the progressive side of copyright reform as a parliamentarian, <laughs> you, you hit a number of those walls, including are they actually going to vote on what you've actually proposed and 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 and, and all of those things. But I, I think um, when I started um, at Creative Commons, clearly, you know, the story of 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 unfairness was, you know, what was happening to the, the Internet Archive when they announced their their national emergency library in response to the massive, you know, waitlist to borrow e-books, and then a group of publishers filed a lawsuit against the Internet Archive, which, you know, is just that is 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 so unfair, and 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 I know that you know it's, it, there's a, a lawsuit that's that's happening, but but you know how can during a pandemic we're trying to give people access, could publishers then take something? I find that really extraordinary um, and goes against, you know, everything that, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, I believe in, in terms of to try and open up uh, information and content in and in, in, in what was a complete crisis that we were facing when everything locked down, where, where kids couldn't go to a physical library, where people couldn't even leave their homes. And, you know, somebody once said about the Internet Archive that, you know, that, that, uh, that um, you know, in in other countries, it would be a publicly financed organisation that's holding, on. and you know, it's an organisation that's doing tremendous good in the world, and and uh, and I think that um, for me, the the unfairness or that wall is is you know, when you're trying to do the right thing to promote openness and sharing of knowledge and sharing of 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 content and culture. For 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 us all, that um, that that uh, that you know, what's happening to them is is to me is very wrong. Um, but you know, you 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 asked me basing walls personally. I think that, um, and this goes back to perhaps what I said at the beginning about how we can work better together <laughs> to to I guess climb those walls together rather than just of lone rangers trying to get up the wall on your own as an organization. I think that the impact that we have, you know, across organizations who believe in open culture and believe in the commons and believe in the public and how we can do that much more together, um, I think is, is, you know, we've been thinking a little bit about what a be you know, better shading looks like. And, and there's a tentative campaign at the moment around a better internet and what that looks like. I think these things are interlinked. And I do think that that type of cooperation, the type of working together that can bring us together to be able to be effective together to solve these problems is, 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 is a challenge to us, you know? Um, but we can do it and it's ours to do. And and the walled culture that you describe and the challenge that we face, you know, all walls can be torn down and walls can be you know, can be climbed and 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 and, uh, and, uh, and I think that we can do that together more effectively. Mm. This 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 nicely leads into my final <laughs> question for you. <laughs> As, um, you know, we we we've been talking a lot about like. like issues for copyright legislation across the globe, failure of uh, adapting copyright to the digital era. Uh, and so my question for you is basically like, like, what should 2030 look like in your opinion? And what do we need to do oh. to make this happen? Oh, that's lovely. You can be optimistic or pessimistic. Well, you can tell I'm a born optimist. And so, <laughs> although, you know, when you work in copyright reform, sometimes you can become more of a pessimist. But um, what I would like to see in 2030 is a greater collaboration of open organisations to be that that counterweight against the other side because the other side have won on so many times and we can't afford for that to happen anymore and much as we can you know, blame blame others and you know it's easy to do that what we have to do together is to try and find the things that we have common ground on and work together in that and and by doing that by 2030 that's quite I mean if we think, this is 2022, eight years will pass quickly. And I don't even want to think how old I will be in 2030. But it's 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 a target where if we are really persistent, if we're really, you know, 
really want to do this, which I think we do, because we can't go on. We were going on to see copyright kept, you know, the other side of this argument winning, where we have got good arguments, a good, uh, you know, um, proposal in terms of what we're doing for the public and being on the public side so people have access to knowledge and culture uh, where, wherever they are in the world and, you know, that 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 argument and the the stories around that about what this does to 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 change people's lives and to you know I talked about my my grandmother influencing me at the very beginning where I didn't you know she didn't have an education and and so you know the importance of libraries access to books being able to 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 you know we always say in Scotland education is emancipation that you know you have you have an education to be able to to use that in the world today. And so I think going back to maybe some of those principles in terms of why it's important, why openness will allow that and enable that, and why what we have to offer is enhancing information, knowledge, culture, creativity, and that by doing what we do, we can ensure that uh, that that we have the, I don't want to use the word empowerment, but we, we have the skills, the tools, the ability to, to, to help each other face the world of today, not the world of this moment, but the world of 2030. But I think we need, as I've said throughout this, this podcast, to work together more effectively as an open movement to face the challenges that we face. And to do that, we have to have the the energy, the ambition, the vision to to see that 2030 is a year of opportunity, not one where we can see yet another copyright directive kind of coming and going, that we actually work together to 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 solve the problems that we see. I think that's a wonderful <laughs> close. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sitting with my fingers and toes crossed, but you know it's <laughs> <laughs> challenge, right, Quinn? You know, we can't just sit back and yeah. let this happen again. We've got to, we've got to, it's ours to do. And I, mm-hmm. that's, that, that responsibility for those of us who see the public domain, the commons of what that does, what that enables, what that, you know, the richness of it, the, you know, um, and how do we get others to be just as convinced and as enthusiastic and um, dare I say, is you know passionate, and, you know of of these causes, is uh, is something that I think we can really work well on together. That's a, a hopeful talk. Yes, it is. Keep that <laughs> to take to take away from this. <laughs> Catherine, thank you, thank you very much for this conversation. It was a very interesting talk. Thank you, Gwen. And, uh, yeah. and thank you for all <laughs> you do. You know, I, I just want to say that well, what you're doing with world culture. It's, it's just, it's, it beautifully highlights the challenges that we face and you do it with such grace and, 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 and also just energy and thoughtfulness. And, you know, so thank you for all that you do. We really, all of us appreciate all the work that you, you're doing. This podcast was produced by HeartCast Media.